This is an SM Media production. Hi folks and welcome to the latest episode of the SM Media Women's Scottish Football Show. I'm Scott Pike. It's a pleasure as always to be your host. I'm delighted as always to be joined by my co-host Suzanne Mulvey. Suzanne, we've had a busy couple of weeks in the women's game and we've got a lot to talk about and we've brought in some really good guests to help us, haven't we? Yeah, I was literally just about the same. So much to talk about. Um, exciting stuff, dramatic stuff. Some not so good stuff, but um, we'll get there. But it's great to have a couple of girls on from Kilmarnock as well. Uh, absolutely, as it will, we'll, we'll not go any further without introducing our special guest tonight. First of all, both from Kilmarnock, it's a pleasure to welcome, first of all, Laura McLaughlin. Hi, thank you for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. We've got a, a lot to discuss. I'm one of the standout players so far this season in SWPL2. It's a pleasure to welcome on Lauren Rayside. Hiya, thank you. It's a pleasure. Right, Suzanne, let's start with what's been happening in the SWPL. I think we have to start with the cup final, which was a tremendous advert for the league. We saw, obviously, Rangers winning, beating Party Thistle. Brilliant story. Let, before we get into the kind of negatives, which can overshadow the, I thought, the game, I thought in terms of the, the advert that it produced, it was brilliant for Scottish football. Yeah, a fantastic. Um, you know, we, we obviously praised Partick Thistle so much for getting to the final. Um, they've the turnaround that they've had at the club. They're only a couple of years in SWPL one, so they've done absolutely fantastic. So to get there, you know, we, we praise them a lot. And then obviously, you know, thirteen minutes into the game, Rangers scoring, and you thought, oh, you, you you thought the worst, you know, and that's no great, you know, is it going to the floodgates going to open? But then within a couple of minutes, what a goal it was for Rachel Donaldson! Fantastic strike, um, and you just seen it. You just seen how much it meant to, to Brian when the camera zoomed into him, you know, all, and the fact that all the players ran to him as well, it just shows what a close-knit close group they've got there. Absolutely fantastic scenes. The crowd went mental, um, but it wasn't to be for them, obviously. Rangers showing exactly why they're top of the table, why they are the team they are, um, and why they get all the recognition, because they've just got goals from every area of the, the, the pitch. Um, some fantastic players. Um, and obviously the likes of Rio Hardy, you know, she's always reliable. Um, Liv McLaughlin getting one. And obviously Mia McCauley as well, fantastic young player. And I was delighted to see her with a goal as well. Laura, in terms of the game, obviously there was a lot of positives that part of this will take. But at the end of the day, Rangers probably showed their class in the end, didn't they? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you can't take it away for Rangers. They've got a strong squad they have for years and... It's only been getting better, so I'm going to keep getting better. But credit to Partick Thistle um, for getting to the final, and they've got such a good group of players as well. Like how far they've come along, and it's the togetherness in that squad. It just it's so obvious. So, um, I've just been going to them, can be proud of themselves for getting there and obviously performing the day as well because it's such a big crowd and then on the, on the TV and stuff like that as well. It's a big experience. So at least they could take that away from from the day as well about um, obviously reaching the final and. I am enjoying the day as well, so that's good. Lauren, we saw obviously the the class Rangers have. They've got so much depth in terms of the likes of it, as as Suzanne said, real hardy, me and Macaulay. They've just got so much depth and when you've got a side like that, they're very difficult to stop. Yeah, definitely. Because they're able to bring like players off the bench that could probably be starting as well to change to change the game or change like if they need to change like formation to try change things up in the game. They've got the, the strength and the, the depth to do that. Suzanne, after the game, we saw probably the, the ugly side of women's football. Now, I don't want to give Joey Barton and his kind any sort of publicity, but I think it's something we do need to talk about because it's still a thing in women's football. There's still this negative, there's the negativity. What was a, a fantastic advert for the women's game? And we're talking about I mean, 16-year-old players are getting like, totally ridiculous abuse and it just paints such a bad light. But what I think I, I wanted to address for you is these people that are bringing these opinions, you're never, ever going to, they, they, you're never, ever going to change them. That That's the best thing, though, in my opinion, is, and I don't know if you agree, you block that out, 
you call it out for what it is and you focus on the positives. That's the only thing I can really say. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. Um, since it's, well, I was going to say since the, the Ava Easton incident happened, you know, with the, the tweets and everything, I've kind of followed it along and been looking at some things. But actually, before that, I had obviously seen some of the, the comments that had been put on for, for Joey Barton. Um, my initial thought when he first put the tweet out, I think it was December or something, initially about women shouldn't be commentating on men's football. If you look at his argument, there was kind of, it was slightly valid, you know. I've never, I've never played in the Premier League. I, I don't know what it's like to be tackled by John Stones, or you know. And that is a valid point. We never know what it's like to be tackled, how fast yeah. they are, you know, tracking back defending. So that that is kind of a valid point. But from there, and the negative, you know, the negative comeback that he got from saying that statement, that you know, slightly is valid. There's so many great commentators, female commentators and female pundits, presenters in the game that they're not all bad. There has been some incidents where they're not not great. But the, the valid point that I felt at the start, people have jumped right on that. They've gave them so much publicity, retweeting, um, jumping on the bandwagon that he's now went from a slight point that he thinks isn't suitable in the game that he loves to now being homophobic, sexist. It is beyond a joke now. And even me, what I'm about to say, hashtag lesbo ball, it's absolutely insane. It's yeah. it, it's so sexist, so um, homophobic that you just... And, and then you're getting all people like what you say, you know, people like him. They're just getting a platform now that people are laughing, they're jumping, they're retweeting. It's it's so ridiculous now that, that it just does... We just need to ignore them. And that's that's how it's always been. I've had criticism, you know, way back to the kitchen, all, all the usual nonsense, and you just have to ignore it. At the end of the day, you know, th these two girls, Lauren and Lauren, they absolutely love football. They don't care the opinions. Eh? There will be hundreds of thousands of men that think the same thing. They think they shouldn't be playing. They don't play because they get paid, because they don't. You know, they're amateur players. They're not at the level, mm -hmm. even the likes of Rangers and Celtic women, Glasgow City. They're not at that level. So they play because they love football. And at the end of the day, nothing is going to take away their passion. They play because they're passionate, because they love the game. Why should they not play? Because it's a game that was invented by men for men. The, the, the comments that, that are getting, you know, thrown into the ring now are just absolutely ridiculous. And I do feel quite passionate about it because I have been following it a lot. But it is just at the stage now where... These people are absolutely loving the platform that they've got to use it in a negative way. And there's so many people that that have big platforms that want to stick up for women and stick up for women's rights and equality. And, you know, they're getting involved. But it is at the point where you're never going to change their mind. It is like what you say, you just need to ignore them because all that we're doing is, you know, adding fuel to the fire. That's exactly what we're doing. Adding fuel to the fire. You're giving them a platform. They love getting the tweets back. Like, you know, example, Nick Doc sticking up for Ava and yeah. then Joey directly tweeting her back. He's absolutely loving this. And the fact that she's obviously from Rangers, he was at Rangers. He's just loving that platform. And it's a shame because he has such a big platform, you know, almost 3 million followers. Um, he's got a, a young daughter. He could be using his platform to help promote the women's game, to help lift up women. And it's not about equal rights. I, I've never once said that I should be paid as much as men. Not once. I, there's not many players that have said they want to be, you know, we, we maybe just want some of the, the training facilities the same. We maybe want to have tracksuits on the 10 sizes too big. You know, there's things like that. We don't want the same wages because we know the money is involved. It is just at the stage now where completely ignore them, completely block them and just keep, you know, going on the right path. Women's football is on a great path. We're only going up and people like him aren't going to bring us down. It does kind of take away from things like a great advert, you know, the game itself. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, we do just need to ignore it and, and keep focused and use our energy on helping promote the game and keep pushing it forward. Laura, I, I think that the big thing that, that is interesting is that because of, I mean, I, I'm coming from it from a very different approach as you guys in terms of you will know firsthand what, what goes on. I, I just I, I observe it and I obviously sympathise. But Suzanne made a good point. Joey Barton's got a following of three million. That's not three million people who totally believe in what he's saying, but he's reaching enough people who 
do have those feelings now. As I say, you're never ever going to change their minds, and I, I don't think we should be trying. But there's so much positivity around women's football that that sort of opinion cannot win. No, it, it definitely can't, and. Yes, like it's, it's like every sport. No, everybody's not going to like every sport, and there's people that will complain and, and say, "Oh, this sport's rubbish, this sport's rubbish." So people should just start viewing women's football as being different to men's football and enjoying it for what it is. It's never going to be the same as men's football. Like there's also going to be the differences all the time. Um, it's been the way women's football's been rising over the last couple of years is insane. It's went from girls turning up to playing in council parks when there's people walk their dogs and to where we are now, so it is getting so much better. So the fact that there is all this negativity coming in with people quick to, to judge it and compare it to the guys the guys game is just it's a bit unfair really, um, considering how far women's football's had to come in the first place. So we can't like let people's negative opinions get in the way. We need to focus on how far it's come and how much further it's got to go yet. Um and I I get women's football that we are trying to fight for a bit of equality so we do want similar to guys. So we do need to accept that, that maybe does come along with some negative comments at times, but it's all about individual players. And like Suzanne says, I play for the love of the game. And no matter what people say to me about me, it's not going to change that. And I'll still want to play regardless of what's said about me. Um, and I really hope that it doesn't affect other players. Um, yes, obviously, it's not nice to hear bad things about you, but we just need to find a way that it's just brushed off. And I think eventually people will get bored of the same pathetic comments. Lauren, the first thing when, when I saw this was gathering steam on Sunday night, the first person I thought of was Ava Easton because it was the biggest day of her life and it's still a massive day, don't get me wrong, like just that opportunity I played in a cup final. But she doesn't deserve that. Nobody deserves that. But all I just what's jumped out to me is just the support that like Erin Cuthbert's been supporting her, Rachel Causey's been everybody. Everybody with any respect has been behind Ava, behind everybody that's been affected by this. And I think that speaks volumes of just how supportive the culture is in the community because it's very, very difficult to unite football fans in Scotland, but this has certainly done it. Yeah, there's definitely a togetherness you can see. Um, and I think the support that Ava's been shown is, is great. Um, there's people from all like, down south and Scotland players and our own teammates and obviously Rangers as well. Uh, they've, they've been retweeting and just putting out messages of support and I think it's amazing to see that support. It's to obviously try and fight back all these negative comments, which it might stop people from putting stuff out if they're going to get fought back, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's worth kind of saying that we, we all of us show our support to every, everybody who's been affected with us and as I say this is what platforms that this is for we try and promote women's football in the best way possible and Joey Barton doesn't speak for everybody that's all I can say Joey Barton's not doesn't represent anywhere near what he thinks he does so let's move on to some positives Suzanne it's been a bit of a fascinating weekend obviously Rangers had to dig deep to beat Habs Celtic beat Glasgow City and we've got a title race at the top of the SWPL yeah, it's it's amazing. This is what you want to see, you know. It, long long gone are the days where it's just maybe being Glasgow City and Hibs and everybody else behind, or Glasgow City way ahead, um, with the, the the top three sides, Rangers, Celtic, Glasgow City. Um, it's absolutely fantastic for me. Again, it's just amazing that Glasgow City are still right up there. They're still, you know, in the title race. Um, they've maybe not got the. The, the platform, they've maybe not got the, the resources that Rangers and Celtic have got, but they're, they're, they're you know, definitely showing that they're still a team to be reckoned with. Um, in terms of the results over the weekend, um, I don't know how many people thought that Rangers would have, you know, came back. Um, they, you know, they have got goals. You've always got, during the game, I was texting one of my friends saying, Rangers have got goals and they'll never write them off. And, and you're literally within a minute, they've scored the equaliser and then, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of minutes later, got the winner. Um, and Cathy Hull, obviously, you know, as they said in the, the SWPL show, Mrs Rangers, she is, I, I played, when I was at Rangers, I played alongside Cathy and she's a, a diehard Rangers fan. And, you know, you can see by the celebration what it meant to her. And um, it's amazing to see, you know, players like that They've, you know, they've got a platform. They're, they're Rangers players who have grown up watching the men, you know, never ever dreamed that they'd get to play for 
a Rangers women because it didn't exist then. And now they're getting to play in fantastic stadiums, Ibrox, Celtic Park. Um, and it's just fantastic to see um, for her getting the goal. And you can never write them off. They've just, the fact that you can bring on the likes of Rio Hardy, Kirsty Howitt, Lizzie Arnott, it's it's frightening the squad depth that they've got. And that's why, you know, they're they're top of the table and probably still favourites for the title. Um, if we jump over to a Celtic, Glasgow City, um, I just felt that Celtic were in control of the game. You know, they, yeah. they showed their strengths and you've got Caitlin Hayes, who we talk about a lot on the show, fantastic player. And it, it's obviously our, our goals that we talk about a lot, the fact that she's a defender and she pops up with really, really important goals. Um, and again, Natasha Flint, she's an absolute natural goal scorer. Um, she shows her strength when she, you know, when she, she's running through her strength. Um, a few people were shouting, thinking it was a foul, but she's just stronger than the defender. She's won the ball, she's through, and a really composed finish um, to see the game off. Um, and just Glasgow City never created enough chances. You know, they never got the ball wide, they never got the ball into the box. But that probably goes down to the fact that they don't really have a target player in there. They don't have an out and out striker like the likes of Natasha Flint or a Rio Hardy or a Jane Ross. They've not got a player like that who they can rely on. Um, and I think that that's possibly their only downfall at the moment that, that could maybe see them just dropping off the, the title race. Laura, I thought Sunday was a cracking advert as well. Celtic, Glasgow City, I mean, and one, I had Arsenal, Man City and one machine and I had Celtic, Glasgow City on the other. And I know what the, we know for a fact what was a better game that afternoon and I think that, was, that kind of tells you everything about how good women's football can be. But Celtic, that was a win Celtic needed just to kind of show that they're title contenders. Not that Glasgow City are out of it, but I think Celtic needed that win more just for confidence and the ambition that they can go and win the league. Yeah, obviously the the fact that they beat Rangers, have also used that as a bit of momentum to go into that game and keep it going. Mm. And they've done well, like watching the game, they did look totally in control for most of it. So um, I think that was important as well that um, they, they did win that game to obviously keep up with Rangers but like you said it's so close at the top and there's still plenty of games left for them to change so they just every team that's kind of fighting to, to win that need to be able to bring the A game every week now And Lauren what do you kind of think about the, the title race Who who's leading the race at the moment who do you think who do you think is going to be the champions it's going to be so tight but if you are Looking towards the end of the season, if they make a prediction, if I was to put you in the spot, who's gonna, who's the front runners to win the league? I think I'd probably tip Rangers. Morty mm-hmm. won it. Because I think the okay. games that they've been playing Celtic, I think that I actually think Celtic have been quite lucky. Um, the one that I watched, I think Celtic got like two penalties, and I think they were very soft. So uh, I think if Rangers are on their game, I think they'll probably win it. Suzanne, at the, the other end of the table, huge three points for Montrose. I mean, they are now in a position where you look at them thinking they're really, really likely to stay up. And I think it's a massive achievement if they do for where they were at the start of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they've got an absolute knack for scoring late goals. Um, absolutely, you know, fantastic. They keep going. They're determined uh, right to the end of every game. And I think that they probably have got that mentality now that, you know, they could get a, a late goal, so they keep pushing, keep pushing, don't let their heads go down. Um, and again, a, a vital, vital three points for them. Um, I, I think at, at 1-1, there was a chance for Hamilton, you know, they're really unfortunate, but just, you know, as I say, you keep pushing right to the end and, and fantastic. It just gives them a wee bit more of a cushion um, to avoid any kind of relegation or playoff spots. Laura, looking at the bottom of the table, who's the, like, Hamilton look to be, that that could be a difficult point for them, but the United United and Hamilton will really need to start picking up points now or they could find themselves in a lot of trouble? Yeah, they, they could. It's obviously still tight between the two, and like I said before, there is still um, plenty of games left for teams to turn it around, but they're going to have to start doing it soon. They can't um, keep going every week and not picking up points. Um, they're going to get as many points on the board now as possible, so... Um, they're going to need everybody to step up um, and of course every game is going to be challenging but if you want it then go out and show that you want it and obviously everyone needs to um, perform and just hope that the day that you're going to play whatever team it is that they're maybe not up to, to scratch as well and you can get the results you need 
Lauren, what's your thoughts in the, the bottom of the table? Who's who's kind of standing out? Like Montrose, that's an, another big big three points for them. But you look at the likes of the sides down there, there's a lot of them with a lot of good players. So it is, one thing is going to be with the splat, it's going to be tight down there. Yeah, I think Montrose have kind of gave herself a wee bit of momentum and help by getting the points that they've had. Um, and I think if they stay on top of their game, I think they'll be fine, they'll be safe. Um, but you never know like, if Hamilton play them, they could they could maybe nick points off them, and then Dundee can maybe nick points off them, and it drags them back down. So it just I think it, it could probably turn on it, maybe turn a wee bit, but you never know. Suzanne, we'll get Lauren Lauren's thoughts in, in SWPL do in a second, but it looks like Queen's Park are in touch and distance of the league. Yeah, definitely. Um, they've been absolutely fantastic this season. Um, gave themselves um, another bit of cushion with a draw um, between Killy and Livingston. Um, and again, just, you know, they're, they're turning up every week. They're getting the points, they're scoring goals um, and, and they're looking like a really strong team. It's, it's exciting that, you know, if they do win the league, which is looking very likely um, for them, another top team to come up to the SWPL1. It's, it's exciting. They've got a good set up there, good facilities. Um, a good manager, Craig Joyce, who knows the game really, really well. Um, so it's exciting for them, definitely. Right, let's get into Comarnock's game at the weekend. We'll start with Laura. Laura, Kelly won, Livingston won. We spoke about it a bit off air. What were your takeaways for, for watching that? So the first half, we went great. We, we didn't perform at all. Um, we were just we were miles off it. We looked quite sluggish, to be honest. Um, we went in at second, also in a half time, and we came back out and realised what we need to do. And we, did, we changed the formation. I think that really helped. We Louise Cowan, the young players come on, and I personally think she's changed the game. Um, she's a great through passes and forward passes, which I think's made a difference. Um, it kind of raised the game a bit and raised the tempo of the game, which I think was needed. It was lacking. Um, I think if we'd finished our chances, the second half we should have won. Um, but credit to Livingston, they stuck in in the first half. They were the better side by far. Um, they're a strong side, so. Um, it was also going to, always going to be a tough game, um, but was, at the end of the day, it was a, a one each draw, so it's probably a few reflections of the game, considering it was a game of two very different halves. Lauren, would you go along with that? Like, in terms of the, the overall game, like, obviously you'd have been on the part, so in terms of the, the game of two halves, can I go along with that sentiment? Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, we, I just don't think we get any like started in the second half at all. Looked very slow, like just weren't really like getting the ball forward quick enough as well and Livingston were kind of on their game in the first half and just putting us under a lot of pressure uh, but I think we kind of gave ourselves a wee kick that we needed in, in, at half time and we came back out a wee bit stronger and created chances and I do actually believe we, we could have possibly nicked the game or won the game like um, but we just they just weren't going in the back of the net to be honest with you. Suzanne, looking at the way kind of Kilmarnock have, have really stood out this season, obviously, like, second place looks to be the kind of target and, like, they look very much front runners. Is there anything kind of standing out to you about Kilmarnock's run so far? Um, SWPL2 is a, a really tough league. There's a lot of good teams that are that are fighting not only to win the league, but obviously get that second spot for the, the playoffs. Um, and I think... That obviously the game at the weekend, your your closest, you know, rivals for that second spot. Obviously getting a, a vital point, um, when and obviously it leaves us still at is it a seven point gap between you, so that's quite a comfortable gap, you know, with it with the running. Um, so I just think that you're you're still grinding out results, um, good performances, um, and like Laura just said, the fact that you've got young players that are coming on and making a difference, it's really positive for women's football in general. It's really positive for Kamarnik, um, young players coming through. Um, and, and obviously making a difference, having an impact at such a, a young age, it's just fantastic um, to see. Right, let's get into talking about your kind of own journeys in the game. Let's start with Laura. Laura, in terms of the way kind of Kilmarnock have progressed over the past few seasons and yourself, your own journey in the game, like how impressed have you been with, with your own development over the past few years and the, the leaps that Kilmarnock have made to really kind of kick on? So I've also I've been at Kilmarnock for years and years now, so I've seen a massive difference from when I first came in. Um, then also the club took us under under their control, and the difference I've seen since we have went with under the main um, side of that has been massive. So much support, and um, they can't do enough for us. So they've also introduced the professional contracts as well, which 
for me is vital is we've got a lot of good young players coming through. I mentioned before the stuff that also came on about a young player Aaron O'Brien and for me mm-hmm. in years to come she is going to be frightening, definitely one to watch. She's sixteen and our, like her strength, our technical ability, she is frightening. Um, she's only going to get better as well. So for us, it's protecting those young players by offering professional contract, but it's also giving the club a bit of protection as well because other teams will start sniffing about these players and um, it's also going to be tempting maybe sometimes for players to move. So having that the professional contract is a bit of protection for both sides. Um, but the, the club have also been great with the full use of rugby park and they're also being, building your training facility, which will be ready in a couple of years, which we'll get full use of. Um, so the club are definitely in the right direction um, for sure so the, the changes have been massive and it's going to be exciting for the future as well to see how much we continue to, to progress as a club Lauren I remember speaking to you a couple of years ago for something for the channel when you said something about when you signed for Kilmarnock it was you just were so impressed with the set up and just how well the, the club kind of looked towards the women's game and kind of a couple of years on for that and the progression you've made as a player how much kind of credit the commander deserve for that and your own development? What's been kind of some of the things that, that you feel you benefit feel you benefited benefited from in the past few years? Yeah, no, commander's a great club. Um, they just look after after you really well. Uh, we get access to Robbie Park, we get access to the gym. Um, we you get a lot of help as well if you need anything. And I think personally for me, what's what's helped me is. Uh, I was getting kind of quite a lot of like wee niggly injuries and stuff like that, and mm-hmm. wasn't really getting like a good like flow on my on my game, and uh, I decided to kind of like go to the gym more, and I think that's helped me massively. Um, being able to just be available every week, so I really think that's helped me as well. Suzanne, I've got something I want to ask you in regards to, to one of the guests on the show. Obviously, you uh, there's a wee bit of reunion here. You were obviously former teammates with Lauren. How do you kind of view Lauren's progression over the past few years and from when you were obviously at Motherwell with her, like to see her where she is now? Like, how impressed have you been with just how much she's progressed? Yeah, um, when I, I when I came into Motherwell, um, it was obviously under Eddie and he brought in so many experienced players that it did, unfortunately, force out a lot of players that were there, um, you know, maybe for, for some amount of time. Um, and there was maybe five or six players that, that stuck around that wanted to, to grind it out and fight for their, their place in the squad because it was some fantastic players, you know. Um, Emma Black, who, you know, is a fantastic career, Scotland Caps, Megan Sneddon, Kerry Montgomery, um Ashley McLaughlin, yeah, there was just so many players there, that, you know, just to name a few, who have such great careers, 19 squad, A squad. Um, and, you know, Lauren was one of the ones that, that, that stuck around and wanted to, to fight it out. Um, and, you know, Lauren will tell you herself, at the start, she didn't really got a lot of playing time. Um, but at the same time, I felt that at training, Lauren was probably learning quite a lot from all the players around her, like the experience that, that myself and some of the other girls had within the game. Um, and, and even that one season, I've seen a massive difference in, in Lauren, just in terms of um, her, her knowledge of the game, in terms of her, her determination. She's had to adapt to, to so many, you know, to playing alongside more experienced players that, you know, weren't kind of young and energetic and, um, you know, just kind of more used the ball better, used their experience within the game. And, and as I say, in that one year, I've seen a massive, massive progression in, in Lorne. And by the end of the season, she was getting a game every single week and, you know, playing alongside me. And she was a great young player. I was always, you know, encouraging her. Um, she was a great winger, putting some great balls in the box, set up so many goals for me. So for me, you know, from that, like Lorne's just kept building. You know, and, and I think as well the experience that she got probably during that time is really helping her with this run in at the end of the season because she she was part of the squad that got promoted to the SWPL one. Um so she knows what it's like at that top end of the table to keep fighting, to have every team below you wanting to take points off you. Um so for for Lauren, it makes me really proud, you know. Lauren was a great young player and for me as well, I feel like it's not just about the player. Like I love it when there's players at the team that are fantastic people. And for me, Lauren, always fantastic. Turn up to training, smile on her face, gave 100%. And as well, a very supportive family. We're always at the sideline. You know, uh, our brother was always there supporting her. And 
Um, for me, it's just it, it's just fantastic that that Lon's kept that journey going and obviously went to a club like Kilmarnock where she feels at home. She feels really comfortable. She's getting the support that she needs, getting pushed forward. Um, and I, you know, I really do hope for for the girls that they, they keep going and obviously get that that playoff spot. Um, and and as well, like what we we're talking about, you know, the bottom end of the table is really exciting. It's obviously exciting for the girls watching because there's potentially their you know playoff opposition if if they get into the playoff. Um, who, you know who who are they going to come up against? So for me, yeah, Lon just a, a fantastic young player, and it does it makes me really proud. Like I just you know keep working hard, and I can't wait to see your journey because you know this isn't even the middle of your journey. This is the beginning of your journey. You've got such a great career ahead of you. No, oh, thank you, Lauren. How important were, were players like Suzanne and like obviously other players you've kind of you played with at Motherwell and kind of other places that for your development and their experience like how pivotal was that to kind of making you a better player and and learning for them because it's important like to have that experience especially players like Suzanne who've done it at such a high level but like, how important is that no it was really important and I'm glad obviously I, I stuck around at Mallow yeah, I learned so much in that that full season especially from Suzanne Suzanne was talking to me at every training session just helping me with everything and I felt like I had to be like a, a sponge at, at some training sessions, honestly. So, no, I, um, it was a good season for me personally as well because I, I did struggle at the start to get in the team. But as the season went on, as Susan said, I kind of got more game time. And we, we also got to the, like, the Scottish Cup final as well, which was massive. Laura, yourself as well, like, kind of some of the experienced players you've played with as well, like, who kind of stands out for, for kind of your career that you've played so far and kind of helping you along the way and kind of learning from because like, as, as we say like the more experience you get the better the better player you become so the, the two for me that so like when I was first coming up to women's football was uh, Claire Doherty who's still at Patrick Thistle and Kim Murphy who's recently retired they took me under their wing um, right from when I was just a, a young teenager um, they were always always had my back if Anyone was trying to give me grief in the park, the two of them were right up at it. If I had any questions, they would always help me, um, encourage me to go on. And just such positive players, if you're having a bad game, they didn't let that get to you. They're always on your back being like, come on, and make me turn it into what was a bad experience into a good experience. And I think it's key that you have players like that in the team, that even if you think you're having a bad game, they can turn it around and it, turned, it helps you, obviously turn your performance around to start playing better and I'll also be always be grateful for them what they've done for me because like I said they put me right under the wing um, and I followed them about for many years played alongside them and I enjoyed every minute of them and they're still really good friends of mine Lauren in terms of Kilmarnock where, where do you see Kilmarnock going because obviously this is a, a big season the chance of getting into the top flight do you think that's possible and do you think that the club like the club obviously have the have the have the ability to do that in terms of the infrastructure, but how important would it be if Kilmarnock were able to get into that top flight? Yeah, it'd be very important. I think the club the club are pushing for it, and so we all are pushing for it as well. So I think we get if we get that playoff spot, I think it will will be hard for whoever we come up against, but anything can happen. It's a, it's a one off game, so yeah, I think it will be really massive if we if we did get get promoted, and it'd be really good. Laura, obviously you've been at Kilmarnock for a long time. How brilliant would that be for the journey of Kilmarnock were able to achieve a motion and, and how do they how do you kinda of see that going towards the end of the season? It would be obviously what an experience and what a journey it would have been for, like for myself, for others at the club like Kirsten Monroe, she's been at Kilmarnock going and like longer than some of the players in the team have been alive. So I think it's <laughs> important for players who've been at the club for, for years, like it would just mean a bit like also mean a lot to them. But in general, like the, the setup now at Kilmarnock, we've got the academy that's they're also pushing players up into the first team. So I think to get into top flight football, like the club deserve it with the backing they're giving us and how well the academy's running that we'll have that good flow of players and although constantly put like have players progressing and stuff like that, which you need to, um, if you're going to be in that league. So I think it's obviously be obviously an incredible experience to, to get up there and play against the best players in the country. Right, it wouldn't be a, a show without uh, having special guests on without a teammates quiz. But before we before we get into that, Suzanne, I want to ask you something in regards to your kind of favourite teammates. 
All right, so I was going to put you in the spot before I put MD else in the spot. Who was the best trainer and worst trainer you ever played with? Uh, oh, the best trainer. Lawrence Holden, you say her, didn't you? <laughs> she's she's up there. She's on the short list. <laughs> um, oh God, this is hard. Um, you have really put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> I'd one of one of the best trainers, but it's no technically for the fact that I mean they did turn up and give a hundred percent all the time. But it was Natalie Ross. And the reason why I'm saying it is because she trained like she played. You know, you say that, or oh, train as you play. And it wasn't always good. I was on the wrong end of some, like, studs up tackles in training. You know, we're, we're, like, play, it was when I was at Rangers. We were playing Glasgow City at the weekend. And she's flying in with studs up at me and uh, at five aside at training. And, you know, I had a couple of arguments. And she's like, I train as I play, I train as I play. <laughs> and, and to me, that's kind of so important that, you can't take that out her at all at training or anything. That's you know that's how she plays, and and for me that's probably why she's kind of getting the mention. Just because like she would give a hundred percent and try and win every single ball, even in a training session. Was there anybody that trained that, like, when you watched them on the park, you were thinking like, how do you not do that in training? Like there must be there must be somebody who wouldn't show nothing in the training ground but go on and be. Top class when they actually went in and played. I, I really hope that this player does not watch this, and I'm not just going to say this because I am really going to. One player who I'd say was quite, a, I'm not going to say a bad trainer, but I think it was more, and she'll even admit it if she watches this, she'll admit it herself. She doesn't like training, um, is Joe Love. Okay. Joe Love would. Just and again, this isn't really a, a totally negative thing. I'm, I'm backtracking here, but she would, you know, she'd just kind of do the training session. It would be nothing special. It wouldn't be, you know, flying in like Natalie Ross trying to win every ball. She'd just turn up. She'd do what she was asked to do, and and that was it. But then, you know, on the park, she would give 110 percent. She'd score some absolutely fantastic goals, ping balls. Um, for me, like her, her training. To, to games, you know, performance was absolutely night and day. Um, and, and she says it herself, she doesn't, you know, she just, she lives for game day. And that's that's probably why, you know, she just, oh, why do we have to train when over a game every day? Um, but what a player, what a fantastic player and, and what a career. Um, and, and you know, she's right up there and kind of my top 10 favourite players that I've played alongside as well. Brilliant. Well, Laura, Laura, you're going to be put in the spot here. It's a ta- chance to name and shame some of your teammates. Oh, no. Right. I'm going to ask you this just one after the other. If you want to kind of disagree with each other's statements, then please do. <laughs> Who's the best trainer at the club? And you can't say yourselves. Abby <laughs> Robinson. Um, I see Dion. Dion. Yeah. Okay. Worst trainer? Um, oh, this is... That's hard. I, don't, I wouldn't let there be a worse train if you were a worse train, you'd be told to go home. That's a good point. <laughs> can, we say, can we just say the goalies? <laughs> ah, the goalies they, never, they never do any of the running. <laughs> that's true, actually, yeah. Um, we get out the running. Oh, that's um, brutal. I don't even think it would be. You could say somebody that's always injured so they don't train a lot. <laughs> that's me at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see um, yourself. <laughs> oh, that's hard. I, I really don't know. Like, like well, you can say me and I'll say you. <laughs> 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 uh, we'll just say each other. That's there not you know. true, though. I can't even say that about you, Lauren. <laughs> Who's the funniest in the dressing room? I'd say Dion again. I, I think would say Dion just... as well. I thought it's Dion was funny when she was on here, I and Dion was, I would say. Most skillful? Lucy Burns. Burnsy, definitely. Yeah. Who's most likely to be a pundit? Hmm. Used to have been no bad tonight. <laughs> I found it. Uh, no, we'd all get slagged by Joey Barton. <laughs> I, I'd say again, say Dion. I think Dion's a good player. Aye, Dion, actually. Mm-hmm. Who picks the music? 
it was the on until Caitlin came from Motherwell. Caitlin. <laughs> yeah, Caitlin, yeah, Caitlin took, took over. What's the uh, song at the moment? I don't even know the names of them, it's just noise. Aye, it's like all this <laughs> dancey music. <laughs> and final question, who is the coach's pet? Who's the kind of wee, wee person in the dressing room who kind of tells the coach what they want to hear? Um, I'll say Abby Robinson. And I would say Abby. <laughs> <laughs> Abby Before we wrap... <laughs> Before we wrap up, I wanted to start a new segment on the show. We're going to do a thing called Suzanne's Shout Out, where Suzanne is going to pick somebody in Scottish football who deserves a mention. I think it's time to, to kind of give a bit of positivity to Scottish football, particularly on the women's side, because there's so much of it. Suzanne, who's your shout out going to this week? Um, before I give you the name, just briefly. To fill every, everyone in, you messaged me, I don't, was it yesterday or the day before? I was probably, you know, talking, nice. about, talking about this new segment, and I went, that's a great idea. And then literally you replied straight away, who is it then? And I was like, well, <laughs> you a But do you know, like, you know, I literally replied within about a minute with a yeah. person because it actually it, didn't yeah. take a lot of time to, to decide. And her name's already been mentioned, and I'm quite glad that Laura mentioned her name earlier on, Claire Doherty. Um when I joined Partick Thistle, it was just before the lockdown, the exact same time that, that Claire joined. Um, so when she made her debut, that was my first game at Partick Thistle as well. And she's one of the players who I've known for a long time, just playing against her. And obviously at Motherwell, our run-in, you know, was against our closest rivals were Kilmarnock. And she was at Kilmarnock at the time. Um, and she was always a, a player that we spoke about before the game, you know, as a threat. Um, she's dropped a bit deeper the last couple of years, but she's still putting in absolutely fantastic performances every single week. You know, I think she's got around about 100 or maybe just over 100 appearances for Partick Thistle. Um, she's still playing regularly. Um, and for me, just a, an absolutely fantastic player and, and a great advert for the game. She, you, you can see her, she gives 100%. Laura's already mentioned that she helps support other players around her. She's always pushing um, everybody. And for me as well, the, the, the likes of last weekend, you know, getting to our first major cup final of her career, um, at, you know, I think she's 35. So for, for that to be her first kind of cup final, and it's just a shame that, that they couldn't, you know, lift the cup for players like herself. Um, but, you know, she even said herself what a fantastic occasion it was, what a fantastic day for all the, the Party Thistle fans and for her family um, to go along and support her. Um, so for me, Claire Doherty um, should be mentioned. She's just somebody that, because she has dropped a bit deeper, you know, she doesn't score as many goals as she used to, so her name's not always in the, in the headlines, but she's a, a fantastic player and every single week she's putting in great performances for Partick Thistle still. Absolutely brilliant. Again, sorry for putting you with short notice for that, but I think it was, <laughs> hey, we need to spread a bit of positivity in the channel, that's what we need to do, but Laura, Lauren, I want to thank you both very much for coming on the show. I want to wish you all the very best for the rest of the season. And you've been brilliant on the show tonight. Thank you very much to you both. Thanks for having us. Thank it's you been very a much. Pleasure. Thank you Cheers. very much. And Suzanne, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thanks very much. And it was great brilliant. as well chatting with Laura and Lauren. You too. Much. Thank you. Thank you, you very much to everyone <laughs> that's tuned in, folks. We will see you all soon for the next episode of the Scottish Women's Football Show. Thank you. Thank you.